Welcome everyone. My name is Alex Pott. I'm going to talk to you today about configuration management in Drupal 8. Um, first of all, who am I? And why am I here? Many of you probably know me from being a Drupal 8 committer and committing many of your patches. And Thank you for your work and thank you for those who um, sponsored me on Git Tip and supported me throughout all of my time as a, a Drupal 8 uh, maintainer. But also, I am the <coughs> maintainer for the configuration management system within Drupal 8. So I'm going to talk to you today about what the configuration, what is configuration management, what is configuration, about using configuration in Drupal 8, um, and then I'm going to delve into what dependencies and configuration are because it's a really important topic. And then I'm going to end up with some principles about configuration management in Drupal 8. So why did we bother doing configuration management in Drupal 8? Um, so there are two reasons that we did it, is that we really wanted to have deployable configuration, and we really wanted a predictable and robust system for deploying the configuration and for managing the configuration within a single site. So what do I mean by deployment? Um, I'm sure that many of us who've worked on Drupal sites have found it necessary to make changes to the, the site in production because there's some emergency from the, the, the client. They're like, I want this change. Change it now. And you make the change. And you forget about it. And then a few months later, you come and you make another change to the site. But you forget about the, the, the change you made in the emergency. And you're like, you break it. And it's like, oh, no. Um, so that's one reason. We wanted to know when changes are going to happen and to be able to inform the user when you're going to overwrite changes that you've already made. Um, I'm sure that many of us have used the features module in Drupal 7 to try and manage a deployment from your developers to production. And you have like five or six developers all working together. They're all creating features. And then you might have a staging environment where you put it all together and you go, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. And you, you go, OK, you enable all the features, and then it breaks. And you don't know why. You've got no idea about where it conflicts. And then you're looking at the features UI, and it's going, overridden, conflict. I don't know what's going on. Um, so <laughs> we wanted to solve that problem. Um, and we also wanted to solve the problem of the fact that even with features and C tools, it was actually difficult to export some of the, the types of things that people were creating in Drupal 7 and then manage, have a managed workflow for them uh, go into production. Um, <coughs> another problem that we had in Drupal 7 is that even the simple things weren't robust. Something as simple as a variable get could be problematic because everywhere you had to put that variable get and call, you had to manage the default right with the variable get. So it would be like variable get, uh, the, 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 the chmod value for file settings, and it was like 777 is the, uh, 755 is the default. And if you wanted to change that, you had to go and find every place to change it. And so that's like, it, it really is difficult to maintain that, especially when you're working in custom with big clients and you're like, okay, you're gonna, we're going to create a variable, it'll be this default, and then someone changes it in one of the modules. Hard to manage. <coughs> um, and also, configuration in Drupal 7 wasn't really aware of where it was being used. So if you created a view with, which exposed a block, you went. Uh, another admin user went and used that block and placed it somewhere in some theme. And then you decided, oh, that view is no longer relevant for, for my one use case. But another user had used it in a different use case. You go, OK, I'm going to delete that view. But you go and break their use case. And you had no warning that that was going to happen. You had to know to go and look in the blocks UI for all the, if there were multiple themes on the site, go and check where it's used, and then no. But that's kind of backwards. So we wanted to fix these problems in Drupal 8. So that's why we have a configuration management system. So <coughs> I've used the word configuration a lot there. So I figure I've got to tell you what I mean by configuration. Um, and in general, like a lot of things, it's easier to define it by what it's not. So first off, configuration is not state. Um, state is a, is a place to store stuff that is particular to the unique site instance. Um, there are things that only matter to that particular instance of that site, regardless of whether it's a development site or a production site or a staging site. A really good example of this is the last time cron was run. 
That's not something you want to deploy from your development environment to your production environment. <coughs> configuration is not cache. And this is really important. The configuration system is expensive. It's reassuringly expensive because it's going to manage things for you. So if you're using it to cache things, it's going to be slow. A cache is a place to store stuff that's expensive to calculate but can be rebuilt. An example of that is something like um, an array containing all of the information about the entity types in your system. All the, all the fields that are on your nodes, users and everything, that all gets cached because you don't want to be reading all the classes which declare all that information every time you um, try and access that information. <coughs> Another thing about data that's cached is that it, it's got to be rebuildable from the, the data, the, the code that you have on your site and all the other data stores, whether that be databases or um, any other consistent data source when the cache is cleared. <sighs> Configuration is not content. <laughs> now this, is, this one is a bit tricky because there are blurred lines, but nodes, taxonomies, and users are going to be stored in the content entity API. We're not going to store them in the configuration management system because um, it's it would it would create situations where 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 you, you you're doing things that are kind of insane. Fields are, are configuration because you create them in development, you can push them to production. But if fields uh, if if fields were fieldable, you, it'd be a nuts situation. So you don't you don't not everything. Is, is, is configuration. Things like nodes, which you want to put fields on. Um, anything, any, any entity that is fieldable, you want users to be able to go into the UI and create fields on that. That is not configuration. So basically, configuration is everything that is left. It's a place to store information that you'd want to synchronize from development to production. And it's, it's information that's often created during site build but it's not typically generated by regular users during normal site operation. Whilst we've been moving things to this API or to these, to these APIs, to the state and cache and configuration during the build of Drupal 8, we've, we've struggled to actually choose where, where, where things are. For example, um, one of the things that people are used to doing is putting their site into maintenance mode. And we're like, hmm, that sounds like something that is configuration. Your site's in maintenance mode. You'd want to deploy that. But actually, that turns out to be state. Because one of the things you want to do before deploying configuration is to put your site into maintenance mode. And then when your configuration deployment is finished, you want to take it out of, st out of maintenance mode. But it's only that specific instance of the site. So it's really important when thinking about where things go to try and work out, well, what, does it apply to that particular instance, or does it apply to something that I would want to be able to deploy? <coughs> so, in Drupal 8, there are two types of configuration. There's simple configuration, which basically means there can be only one instance of that. Um, so a classic example is your site name. There is only one site name. Your site does not have multiple names, it is called what it is. So we have, in, we have a configuration object called system.site, and in there there's a configuration key called name, and that has a value, and that is your site name. The other type of configuration we have is we have configuration entities. These are things that, where there can be none on your site, or there can be many. Um, or there can be one, but that is just a, an instance of many. So things that are configuration entities in Drupal 8 are your node types, fields, vocabularies, filter formats, um, views of configuration entities, and, and, and these are the things that you, you, you build during your site build and you want to deploy. Here's a helpful Venn diagram that kind of tries to show the relationship between configuration and config. So um, 
as you can see, like there's the content, the, the content entities that I was talking about earlier, there's nodes, there's comments, they're not stored in configuration. But all the things in the lighter blue, they're all stored in configuration. So they include the configuration entities, as I said, views, vocabularies, contact categories, that's another type of config entity. Menus are config entities. And then they could include the simple configuration, which is site info, user mails, and stuff like that. There are a few things that still live outside um, configuration or configuration or entities, and they're a bit weird. We didn't get round to path aliases, basically. So <coughs> now I'm going to talk a bit, do a quick recap on how we use configuration in Drupal 8. So the first thing that most people want to do with configuration is that they want to be able to access it. And it's really simple. Using the example of the site name that I talked about earlier, you just use the, the config factory of which slash Drupal config is, is an alias to get. That's a more procedural type of code, but we won't delve into that. And then you get the configuration object name, get the key name, and that would then put the site name in that variable, and then you can go off and use it. Configuration entities, each configuration entity type has a class. So here's how we would load a node type in Drupal 8. So <coughs> the node type is the class. There's a static method, helper method on there for you, just to load up the article. And then because each, each configuration entity has its own class, there are methods on there that help you interact with the data that that contains. So if you want to get the help text for a node type, there's a nice little method there, get help. And there it is. So how do I create these types of configuration? Most of the configuration that people will be creating will be during module installation or through the UI. So we'll, we'll go through how I do it for module installation. So I have a module. Here's the file module in Drupal 8. It has two pieces of configuration. Um, it has, a, it has a simple configuration file called file.settings.yaml. That that's a single instance of configuration that um, configures things for the file module. It also provides a view that allows you to see where files are used. <coughs> now, we have two directories there, install and optional. And what, what this means, this is, this is the first like, example of dependencies that we're going to see. We're going to do a lot more talking about dependencies later. Um, for for the, the file that's in the install directory, that has to be created during the install. If for whatever reason it fails to create that, it will actually stop you installing. Obviously, there can't be another file.settings configuration object before you've installed the file module because all configuration starts with the module that provides the configuration itself. So simple configuration, file.settings, that's owned by the file module. Views, however, obviously that's not owned by the file module because it's a view. And views only can exist, they only make sense to the system if views is installed. So if you install views first and then you install the file module, it will automatically go, hey, I can, I can install that because it's it's the, the file is contained within the file module, but views is, also, views is enabled, so it's, it's there. If views was not installed, because it's optional, it's like, I can't install that. I won't install it. If you later go and install views, it will go and search all the optional configuration that's there, go, does it exist yet? Are the dependencies met by this installation? And pick it up. <coughs> so what goes in these files? I'm just going to show you the file settings file because a view is really complicated. Um, so. This is just a very, very simple configuration file that, that basically says that the file description will be a text field and will allow you to put 128 characters in there, and it, and it configures where the icon directory is. <coughs> so how do I create configuration through the API? So here we, so here we have, um, again, calling out to the config factory. Um, and unlike before, it's not just a simple get. 
we have to get an editable version of it. Um, and the reason for this is that when we save configuration, we need to ensure that you're dealing with the configuration as, as it is actually in the configuration system. The configuration factory provides methods to override configuration at runtime. The classic case of this would be in your settings PHP where you override, override a configuration variable. Um, other examples are where you, where you translate it to different languages. Um, but using the get editable version means that you get the raw thing and then you can just set the key to some value and save it. And then that will allow you to change configuration and create it. So how would I create a node type? Again, using the, the node type class, there's a static helper to help you create such objects. Um, you just go create, and then it's a type of news, a news story. And then again, there are, there are methods on the config entity to help you um, manage the, the, what, what that config entity could do. So if I want to set the preview mode to Drupal optional, so when I'm saving that node type, it, it says you can preview, um, you don't have to, um, then that's what that would do. And then I save it, and then it exists on the system. <coughs> so let's talk a bit more about configuration entities, because that's why we're here. Simple configuration is pretty simple. Um, I don't advise creating it through the API, because uh, it's provided by a module. There's only supposed to be one instance. If you're creating it through an API, there might be more than one. Um, it's just, it's just exactly as it is in the name. It is simple, but configuration entities certainly are not simple, and they're really not simple when they have dependencies. So <laughs> Drupal, the reason we use it is it offers us a really rich interface to build complex websites. Within a few clicks in the UI, we can create views, content entities with custom fields, and then we can go and, create, go and change that view to limit it to only display uh, content of a, of a particular type. Then we can change, <laughs> we can add a display to that view, which then puts that information in a block. We can then go and place that on a page. And before we, before we know it, we've built a, a, a complex interrelationship of entities on the site that have to be managed together. And in previous versions of Drupal, it was like, OK, we're not going to tell you about how they relate. But because we want to be able to deploy configuration, we have to know how they relate. Because without knowing how they relate, we can't decide what order to do things in. So if you have a view that depends on a node type, and you just try and create that through a deployment, and the, the deployment doesn't contain the node type, if we don't have that information to hand, then it'll create the view, but it won't work. And we want, it, we want stuff to work. We want it to be robust. <coughs> so, configuration management is the way that Drupal manages this complexity. So here's um, a very simple example of, I've got a node type, it has a field on, that field will depend on a field storage, there'll be an entity display which will say that I'm going to display that field, um, and that field will depend on that node type. Um, this is <laughs> a way of explaining this. It's like I, I go into the UI, I create the content type, I add fields to it, and then I configure how they are shown using that entity display. For example, I can create a news node type. I can attach an image to it called main photo. Um, that image field will consist of two config entities, which is the field expression on the node type and the field storage, how it's actually stored in the, in the database. Um, and then I can configure how that, that is formatted on the page when it's displayed through an entity display. All those things are, are relating together. If I don't have the node type, I can't have the field. If I don't have the field, I can't have the entity display. So what this allows us to do is to actually inform the user when we do things. So if I went and deleted a field, now in Drupal 8, I'm able to say, actually, 
um, this information is going to be updated, these other things. So if I delete this field tags, obviously I'm going to affect how that is, th that those displays are managed because that field's no longer going to be there. What's nice about these dependencies on the entity form display and the view display is that when you delete a field from those, it can just be removed simply. Um, it's not that simple, obviously, when you uninstall something. So if I go and uninstall views, it now tells me, as you would expect, it's going to uninstall all the views. But it's also, in this instance, because I've placed the who's online block, which is provided by a view, going to remove that block. Because that block cannot be existing on your site if you don't have views to provide the data for it. Um, and so this allows us in Drupal 8 to build up a much better picture of the potential consequences of an action. And it's also going to make it significantly more robust because orphaned configuration can't exist. If a configuration still exists and it has no meaning, then your site is broken. And in Drupal 8, as long as all the config entities are declaring their dependencies correctly, that won't happen. So what can configuration entities depend on? They can depend on four types of things. They can depend on modules, themes, other configuration entities, and content. So as I said earlier, every configuration entity has an implicit dependency on the module it provides. In the file module example, that view that it was, that the view was there obviously depends on views. <coughs> and that's because that module contains the code for actually implementing that config entity inter interface. So the views has a class called view which implements config entity interface. Without that, the view configuration is meaningless. Um, another example is roles. Roles are, are, are dependent on the user module because without the user module, the role configuration entity does not exist. Additional dependencies can be added based on the logic implemented by the configuration entity. So now I'm moving into the subject of how do these config entities get dependencies? To repeat myself, because it's well worth knowing, the first dependency that every bit of configuration has, whether it's simple or a config entity, is based on the config object name. So node settings depends on node. The view depends on a view. But they also can depend on information that's contained within them. A simple example are block config entities. Block config entities say where a block is placed. One of the keys that it has is theme. That theme says that key says which theme it's enabled in. If you uninstall the theme, that block configuration entity has no meaning should be deleted. But there are other ways in which dependencies can be introduced into configuration entities. And I'm going to talk about two of them now, um, which are provided by the config entity base class. First up, <coughs> third party settings. Now third party settings are the way in which all configuration entities can be altered by another module that doesn't provide it. So if you want to attach an information to a node type so that it gets deployed at the same time as a node type, you can use this system to do that. Um, an example that we have in core is that the content translation module includes third-party settings to add per-bundle translation settings to the content language settings. So a bit of a mouthful. Multilingual Multilingual is really powerful in Drupal 8. Every single type of thing can basically be translated in Drupal 8. Um, and you can change on a per bundle level whether or not a node is translatable. And in fact, it's not just nodes are translatable per bundle. Like um, taxonomy terms are translatable per bundle. Anything is translatable per bundle. And we do that by having language content settings. And the content translation module basically adds information to that configuration entity. So, for example, I can make my news node type translatable by um, going into the UI, saying that's translatable, and then that will add 
these dependencies to my language.contentsettings.node.use. It obviously depends on the actual bundle itself, but now it also depends on the content translation module <coughs> because that, that's then saying that this, that, that this content translation module is providing the ability to translate per bundle. And the way in which we do that is by using two really simple methods that all config entities have, which is set third-party settings and get third-party settings. And you can provide, like, when you, when you call it, you just provide the module that's adding it and a key and a value, and then you can get it in the same way. And what's great about this, as opposed to, like, Drupal 7, is that you don't have, like, dumping grounds. or well, the dumping ground of modules is, is, is controlled. So in, in Drupal 7, we had uh, a blob on the field table where just modules would put stuff, throw stuff, and go, OK, it's there. And then I know that when I'm installed, I can go to that, that column and get my settings. But now in Drupal 8, we have a defined way of doing that so that when that module is uninstalled, we can say, ah, oh, we're just going to clean that up for you. So you don't have settings that another module has added to a config entity just left lying around polluting your configuration and making it confusing. The other way, main way that configuration gets um, dependencies are plugins. Plugins are Drupal 8's API for combining configurable settings with reusable code. So many of <laughs> Core's plugins' configurable settings are actually stored, obviously, in configuration. So example of plugins that we have in, in Drupal 8 are block plugins, filter plugins, and view display plugins. And there's, there's lots and lots of plugins in Drupal 8. Um, but I'm just going to take you through the example of a filter plugin. So here we have, um, it's very similar to Drupal 7, the, 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 the UI for configuring a filter format. And this is the plain text filter format that you get with the standard profile. And it's basically, there's a, there's a load of tick boxes down there. And the, so the top one is saying display any HTML as plain text. That's actually a filter plugin called filter HTML escape. Um, that when you tick that, that says store this in this in the in the filter format. When you process text with this filter format, use that plugin to escape the text. Um, and then the, the the other options that you're kind of used to. We can zoom in a bit. Um, <coughs> We also have like the converting line breaks. That's a different plugin. Filter auto p. We have like the converting of URLs into links. That's another plugin. Um, and plugins aren't just like on or off. They can add more things to a, to a filter format. Like how long is the maximum length, uh, the, the maximum text length of your URL. So that's configuration that's specific to the filter URL plugin. Um, and that. <laughs> that means that we can build up from all those, the plugin configuration, the filter format configuration. Plain text, as it's provided in core, has no dependencies. The reason being is that it, all of the plugins that it configures are also provided by the filter module. And as I said, configuration entities depend implicitly on the module that provides them. So a filter format is provided by filter, all the plugins are provided by filter, there are no more dependencies. However, there is this option on your filter screen, which is track images uploaded via a text editor. That filter plugin is provided by the editor module. And if I go in the UI and I tick that, what happens is I have a dependency in my filter format on the editor module, which means that Drupal now knows that if I remove the editor module and install it, then I have to do something with this filter format. Obviously, the right thing to do here is not delete your filter format because that would make content insecure, but at least it tells you that you're using it. Um, and this all works because filter formats, the, the config entity class, implements entity with plugin collection interface, which basically says to Drupal, when you save this, check which plugins it's using, the filter format, where do they come from? If they're provided by a module that's not filter, 
add them to the list of dependencies as we did there. <coughs> Plugins can also add dynamic dependencies. So if the plugin pulls in information from elsewhere in the system, um, it can then go, actually, you're dependent on that. And that's often how config dependencies appear in your configuration. So when your view, for example, is dependent on a role, because you've said this view can only be accessed by administrators. So if you went and deleted the administrator role, that view then has no meaning anymore, because it can only be accessed there. So we're able to build up a whole picture of, of how your configuration and plugins come together. I'm sorry, I, I, I feel that that was probably quite confusing. <laughs> um, so in, in the views UI, you have a place where you can configure how your view is accessed. That's, a, that's an access plugin for views. And there's a particular flavor of that access plugin that says, actually, limit it to these roles. When you go in the views UI and you say this view can only be accessed by that role, that then uses the plugin configuration to say that view then is dependent upon that role, which is a configuration entity itself. <coughs> there are two other types of dependencies that come out of the box with Core. There are the ability to depend on content. Um, an example of this in Core would be the content block module, which provides a block content entity, where you can just create blocks of random text. Um, this module, then, when you place one of those blocks, that block is then dependent upon that piece of content. So if you delete that content, the system's able to say, actually, I need to go and delete that block config entity. <coughs> um, and we also have the occasional requirement of an enforced dependency, which is basically where the module provides something like a node type, for example, book, and that node type would have no meaning if the book module wasn't installed, and so you just add that to the configuration. But it's not very common. So here are some principles that we've discovered for managing configuration sanely in Drupal 8. Firstly, configuration shouldn't change unexpectedly. So if you load a node type and immediately save it, if that actually changes the underlying configuration, then something has gone wrong. Put it another way, if all the runtime dependencies of the configuration are satisfied, then regardless of any other code being available to the system, i.e. installing yet another module, the configuration shouldn't change. So, you're, so if you have a module, it shouldn't just, on installation, go and change every other piece of configuration because you're breaking the contract that, that the configuration is what the user has configured, not what the module has configured. <coughs> Here's one that will make people's lives a lot easier. If you are declaring a, a sequence in your configuration file, you need to sort the configuration in a predictable order that does not change often. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you have this type of configuration where you have um, a position key, this, this is how views arranges its, its, its displays, um, and you want to put where it, where it appears, it seems like you might want to sort the configura the, the, those configuration keys by the position. But actually, if you do that, when it comes to if someone goes and changes the position of one of these things, you get a config diff that looks a little bit like this, which is like all that's changed here is the position of one has been moved to two and the position of two has been moved to one. And what you really want is something that looks like that. It's a lot easier to tell what's gone on. Um, and so you've just got to be really careful when creating uh, lists of things in configuration that you sort by something that's predictable, and when a user makes a change, that, that the difference does not change everything. The, other, the final principle is that when a dependency is removed, configuration by default is deleted. 
<coughs> and that's because, as I've said before, we want to keep the system working. So the default case, if you delete a role and there are views that depend on it, is that it's going to remove the view. If the, you delete a field and there are views that depend on it, it's going to delete the view. If you um, delete a, if you delete a vocabulary and there are taxonomy terms that depend on it, the taxonomy terms can't exist. We, can't, we don't want to have a broken system because at the end of the day, we want to be able to depend on configuration. And <coughs> so here's what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to try and show that you can depend on configuration. As I said, I wasn't going to talk about deployment mechanisms, but I'm going to show you what you can actually achieve with the Drupal 8 configuration management system. So a little bit of a, not a live demo, but a demo of sorts. So here's a site I have, which is basically minimal plus a node type. I'm logged in as admin here, and I'm going to create some content. Put some stuff in there probably, but it doesn't really matter what it is. I'm going to save it. My developers go away. This is my production site. It looks terrible. They go away and they like, okay, I'm going to theme it, I'm going to install views, I'm going to go and do a load of stuff, and then I'm going to give you some a configuration package to um, synchronize with this site. So at the moment, I have nothing in my staging directory, and I'm going to copy all of the configuration that they've given me and put it in my staging directory. So if I have a look at what's in my staging directory, I have a lot of stuff. I have views, which isn't even enabled on the site. I have search pages. I have more node types. I only have the page type on the site that I'm on. I've got fields for that. I've got entity displays, all sorts of stuff coming in. Configuration is integrated with Drush, so I could do the import through Drush. If I did that, it's going to tell me what it's doing. It's going to create a load of configuration. It's going to update core extensions, so we're actually going to install modules and themes. Um, it's going to remove some configuration. That's because the UUIDs have changed. But I won't do that through that. I'm going to show you the UI, because my minimal site has uh, the config module on. So here I'm seeing <laughs> the very minimal config UI. Um, it's telling me it's going to create all of this configuration. It's basically the same list, but one difference is that I actually are able, I'm able to view the differences here. Um, so I can see that I'm going to install all these modules. I'm going to install block content. I'm going to install editor. All of these things are going to be installed during this. So let's do it. Minimal, as you can see, comes with Stark, and Stark is a very Stark theme these days. Well done, themers, for declassing everything. Um, yeah. So it's telling you what it's doing. It's installing views. It's installing Classy, which is the theme. It's deleting stuff. It's creating content entities, creating views, creating fields. Bang. Done. Ooh, seven. Nice. <laughs> yeah. um, come back to my content. Ah, a nice view which to manage my content with. Um, and I can see that my content is still there. Um, still there with its, its, its actual body. I haven't, I haven't deleted that. I've preserved that field. Yet now it's all, it's all there. I can come to my site structure. I can see that I have a load of views. Views wasn't even installed before. And that's all been done in a way that's completely reliable and repeatable. 
Um, and that is configuration management in Drupal 8. Uh -oh. Didn't mean to do that. Now you're going to see my keynote skills, which are really bad. How do I start on this slide? So yeah, last up, I'm going to thank a few people who helped me write um, some of the text behind this. That's like XJM. Um, the the big Venn diagram was from Gabor, and he's done a lot of work on configuration as well. Catch and Matthew Tift and Susan McCormack all helped me prepare text. So thanks to them. Um, here are some links, resources, so that if you come back to the, the presentation notes, they'll be there. I'll, I'll add these links to the, to the uh, page on the conference site. Um, last but not least, there's a sprint on Friday, as you've probably been told a hundred times. Please come. We've still got um, criticals to do on Drupal 8, and I really want to see it out as soon as possible. And I'm really excited for October the 7th, so let's get it done. And yeah, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, come to the mic. I was interested to see that um, taxonomy vocabularies and taxonomy terms are split in terms of where you put them in terms of configuration or content, and yeah. also menus, that the menu itself and the menu items. Um, so two questions. Why were they split like that? Um, and the second question, as kind of a developer, what I often find is like I want to put up a whole menu that for me a menu very often is usually kind of a developer thing. Mm -hmm. So how would I do that? Um, so f the first question was why um, are some things content and why are some things config with specific reference to taxonomy terms and vocabularies. Um, yeah, taxonomy term is one of the, the, the more difficult one, uh, ones, but in general we've erred on the side of content when people want something to be fieldable. So there are use cases in core where people want to add additional fields to, um, to taxonomies. And so in order to do that, we need the full content entity system. The other thing about taxonomies is that they're often user-created whilst entering content. Um, so it, so we've, we, when, there's a, when there's something difficult to choose between, we've erred on the, the side which gives the user the most power. It does, I mean, one of the things that everyone is finding with configuration management in Drupal 8 is that it exposes the lack of content deployment. Um, and there are at least three or four efforts that I know of to, to introduce reliable content deployment as well in Drupal 8. So I'm looking forward to them bearing fruit. I think with menu links, there are, I think, three ways in core in which we can provide them. And one of them is actually backed onto, onto config. So it is possible to, to deploy menu links using, using config. So it's not, it's not, it's not as, as simple as all menu links are content. So that, then that Venn diagram might be a little out of date. That's what I'm trying to say. So the, the answer to the how was there, there are initiatives to do it? Um, there are, there are, so for content deployment, there are modules that people are developing. Okay. So the author of Deploy for Drupal 7, Dixon, is, is, is hard at work on a, content deploy, a whole suite of content deployment stuff for Drupal 8. Um, there's something called Entity Pilot, which is a service developed by um, Lee Rowlands that allows you to kind of package up your content and deploy it along with, uh, along with configuration. And in fact, in core, we've, we've left the question a little bit open, and we've allowed um, uh, the missing content dependencies to be calculated during that config import that you just saw. Um, and if there is stuff to do, it's stubbed out. So there's an event that these modules can hook into and create content at the right point. So, so we've, we've tried to prepare it, but some things have to still be done in contract. OK, thank you. So first up, I want to say this all looks amazing. Thank you for your hard work and everyone else's. Um, I have a question about uh, something that came up in another related session. Um, and I tested it out afterwards, which was that it doesn't seem possible to site install, uh, create a brand new site, uh, configure the site in some way, um, 
run another site install and import that configuration. And this would be uh, very important and valuable among other places in uh, automated testing. Um, so I'm curious about uh, your thoughts on if it's possible to implement something like that, or what's the thinking of, of why it would not be possible? OK. Um, so the question was, like, I've got this set of configuration. Why can't I just site, do a site install from it, I think? More or less. Why is, I mean, why is it not repeatable yeah. in that way? Um, so I actually did create a critical issue for that, and I was told that it was a feature too far. Um, so there are two contrib ways of currently supporting it. There's the config installer module, which I maintain and is currently broken. Um, <laughs> because I've been busy with other things. Uh, but basically what that allows you to do is, is during the install, actually in the install form, it says get configuration from somewhere. And you can just point it to a directory, and it'll just pull in all that, and it'll override the install profile and just do that. Um, what's also intriguing is what features has become in Drupal 8. Mike Potter has done some awesome work to basically make features a config packager. So it packages configuration into modules, and modules become the way of deploying configuration for, for, for packaging a feature, and a feature is just a set of configuration. But they also have, apart from just a module builder, they have an install profile builder, which basically says, OK, I'm going to export all of this configuration from this site into an install profile and make that repeatable. So there's, there's at least two ways to potentially solve that problem. And what was the name of the module you said you were maintaining but is currently broken? Config installer. Config installer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think the main thing I wanted to say is again, just thank you so much because I th I just seen every major you know obstacle with Drupal development just solved magically before my eyes. There, I just think it's fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Um, and it's just amazing how all of your site configuration is just sort of defined with dependencies like that. I mean, has there been any work done? to sort of offer a visualization of, of your Drupal site um, and show that, that, that graph, show that tree. Um. Yep, um, there is. There's, there is a config graph module um, maintained by myself. It's really experimental. <laughs> D does it work? Um, maybe. <laughs> it doesn't have any tests. It was, like, it was written in, in a weekend of like, oh, this should be possible. Now I've bothered, now I've added all these dependencies. And, and behind all the dependencies, when, it, when you uninstall or delete configuration, it builds up um, an, an acyclic graph of that. And there are tools just to dump acyclic graphs into PDF. So it's, it's, it's really simple. It relies on something from uh, PHP Documenter has a PHP component that does that. So it's, it's like the simplest code. Um, I could try and find it, <laughs> or, the, or the output of it, if you want to come up and see later, rather yeah, than like I'll, I'll catch it at the end. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Virtue, you said you had a hard one. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, I just have a question because uh, I was playing with features and um, very basic but stupid example. So in features, I exported like the basic article uh, standard profile insta installation YAML file, and uh, yeah, of course I wasn't able to import it. So if I was using it on an, on another site that already had a uh, article article YAML file or an article mm -hmm. definition. Um, I was not able to ins install it because there were conflicts. So is there any smooth way of resolving this? Um, okay. Yes. Um, it's to be, uh, so what you've done there is you've, you've created, you've done a Drupal standard install in two different places. And the moment that you do that, um, those are two different site instances. If you had done a Drupal site install, copied your database, moved that, then it would have worked. And the reason being is that when you create configuration entities, is that we can't know just because it has the same name that it really is the same thing. Um, and in order to help us manage those conflicts before they occur, we assign a UUID to every single every single configuration entity in call. So if they conflict, then 
the system can't it can't know that that is actually the same article type. So so that's the way around. The way around is to build your sites in repeatable and predictable ways, which is exactly why that first question about how to build a site from a known set of configuration is so important, and why I, I predict like the, the the building install profiles through features or using the config installer will become recommended ways of, of working with config to build multiple instances of the same site. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I was aware of that, but um, if I would export a certain module in features, yeah. that would be maybe um, not installable as a certain feature module if it conflicts. So, and it totally just stops. It doesn't say where it conflicts. It mm. doesn't help me to resolve this conflict. And that's the point. Yeah, I mean. and that has to be built in features. Features needs to tell you exactly where it conflicts and then what are the likely resolutions. In the instance where um, I think features is going to have the ability to rename your configuration in, in, on import and then change all the names of all the dependencies of, of its package. So that the name is something fluid in the feature so that when it, when it gets into your site, if there is a conflict, it automatically handles that. But it has to be built. Like features is only like, was was in like beta in LA, so it's 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 young code. Yeah. Okay. I I wanted to first ask a question like how would you first develop a a, a site and then deploy it, because with core you can't do that at the moment. But you answered that question already. So now I want to ask another question that you you kind of set yourself up because you said. <laughs> Um, when the manager wants to have like this emergency fix and then you fix it on the live side and then you develop something else, then it would get forgotten. Now it doesn't get forgotten, but you see that it's getting deleted when you synchronize the configuration. Like, what, what would your recommended way be to keep that, but yet somehow merge? <laughs> So, the state. so what, if I was managing a site which had um, lots of people with the ability to change uh, stuff on production, and and I had lots of developers working on that site as well, I would be I, I would be looking to set up a daily job that exports configuration from production and compares it against my known staging merged environment, and would then notify me if there was any differences so that I would then become immediately aware when someone's done something on production. And there are modules around this already. Um, I think there's a, like a config log module that would then, which logs everything. But yeah, that stuff is going to be possible. Auditing is, uh, because, <coughs> because each configuration object um, is, is stored through a predictable API, there are, there are events that occur on every time that config saves. You just create a listener to that. And then you could, expo on that, just save that configuration out to somewhere and just notify people. You could even just have a module that was like, email me any time that configuration has changed, which wasn't possible in Drupal 7, right? Because you'd have to implement every single hook everywhere in the system to do that. Now you have one place to do that. OK, thanks. Hi, just Hi. a simple question. Where does the rules come into, content or configuration? Uh, as f I have not looked at rules in Drupal 8, but if that's not configuration, I don't know what is. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, it's more of a follow-up to a previous question that, uh, sorry, I don't remember the, the name asked about. Uh, so you say to, to get a job to uh, notify all, always about configuration changes, but some configuration changes, I think, are not meant to be lived in a configuration file, like for example, the slide slogan. I th s such thing can probably always live in a database. Maybe is there a kind of an option to just say this property only, this site slogan or site name, just live in the database all the time without any, uh, so that the configuration doesn't even touch it? No. Um, well, okay, it's Drupal, so uh, you can, you could create a module that provided a configuration override which stored certain things outside of c the configuration system. Um, 
but in doing that you would make your site harder to maintain because it would be so left field to other developers who would then come and work on your project there's no harm in storing something in configuration that would change as rarely as a slight slogan so but it's possible like in Drupal you can always do anything there's always an auto hook or an event or a hook that will let you do something that, like that Hi. Uh, thanks for everything you have done uh, in this uh, group. And uh, I have two questions. The first is maybe silly. Uh, would would it be possible to have the configuration files in the file structure we want, or we are forced to use a, a file pattern like my model dot settings dot yam? Um, again. Uh so where where do you want like in, in your your module has a particular structure, um, and so your config slash install directory is where it looks for configuration during the installation. Changing that would be it would be possible, but like again, it, it's like you're making something non-standard. Um, if you're talking about where you store your staged configuration, yes, um, that's just a setting in your settings PHP. By default, we put it in some obfuscated directory inside your site's files directory because that's the only place where we can create um, create files. But uh, it's totally up to you where that okay. goes. And if you want to do a completely secure Drupal, that would be outside your web route. Okay. It's just configured. Um, and uh, also, you're, you're coming back to a, a, something that I should have said when I started talking, that during the Drupal 8 cycle on configuration, there was a lot of talk about configuration being stored in files, and that's where your active store is. That's no longer the case. In, 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 in your active configuration is actually stored in the database. It's only when you export it do you get it in the file format. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we are now using third-party libraries from PHP especially, uh, can we store configuration there? in the same system? Um, okay. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Since we have dependencies, for example, for a module or for a with Composer or anything? So, so, but that, that, so that's code, that's not configuration. Say, I mean, it would be possible to write an alternative config storage that used a PHP library to put it somewhere else, if you wanted to get really complicated. But, but, um, in in terms of like the 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 relationship between composer dependencies and configuration dependencies, that they're just separate things. Like that's about um, in, including third party libraries is about providing uh, a code to core to depend on. It's not about providing expressions of configuration. Um, that's an expression of the application. It's not the same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask for, um, or I just wanted to give a slight answer, but as well as ask something. Like uh, so the, the situation of a multi-site, so on a multi-site, of course, the site name would always vary. And I think in the previous talk about uh, config configuration, there was the uh, answer so that you can always go and uh, overwrite the configuration in the settings PHP. But yeah. this would mean that if I have my site name or, for example, a, a tw Twitter API key or something like, not being editable in the CMS backend, that always would rely on manually updating the settings PHP, right? Yep. No other way around. Well, there are other ways around, but that if you put it in your settings PHP, that's the value that it is. I mean, I'm not. I really don't like that way of working with configuration, because it it tends to be something that people forget about, and it it, it then creates like big inconsistencies in your UI because you you go to a page where you can configure your site name and it says it's one thing, but you see up there it's another thing. Um, because I can also imagine the very same thing. So I would go and make this f uh, field, for example, only readable, uh, read it off, off, all out of the uh, settings PHP. Um, in the case of the tw Twitter API, that would, would be the configuration of a module that somehow gets the value somewhere. Uh, it's kind of, I don't know. I didn't get the question there. So you, you really don't see any way around that. 
around uh, what am I trying to get around? Uh, writing it only in code, different uh, configuration in code by overriding the database and YAML uh, based co configuration. Sometimes I really <laughs> ask strange questions. I know. Um, no, you so don't you don't see any way around uh, besides from uh, writing it into the settings PHP of the various uh, various uh, multi sites, right? Um, there are. There, I mean, com the configuration factory is what is what integrates the configuration system with the with the rest of the application. The configuration. The architecture of that is that it gets the storage injected and it reads from the storage. It then asks, it then it says, do I have any overriders? And by default, it, the, there is only one overrider in standard profile, and that's the override that comes from settings PHP. So any overrides in there are applied. You can add custom overriders. Um, the only one we have in core is language, because we want to be able to translate configuration. But modules can add overriders to the config factory, and they can do crazy things in there. They can, you can, it can go and get your configuration from, some, from somewhere completely different. Um, but if you were going to do that for everything, then you would replace the config storage. But if you're going to do it in one specific instance, and this was the same answer that I just gave, but <laughs> you can actually do that there. Well, whether that's recommended practice, I wouldn't say so, but because it, it starts to make everything a little bit unpredictable. Um, and one of the great advantages of the configuration system is because everything's statically stored in files, it doesn't change. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, two questions. First, is there uh, any democratic way to say this is uh, content and this is, is uh, configuration? For instance, by default, you decide this is configuration and this is content. But for instance, in the future, I want to have like, oh, this is actually uh, configuration for our specific purpose. Is it possible to override that? Um, not without a lot of work. OK, so it's possible, but uh, well, it's, I would just, it's a I hassle, would, basically. Yes. OK, and second question, since we are uh, removing the variable set and variable get, uh, is there a way to, I don't know, I haven't checked, but is there a way to upgrade from Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 and then just magically uh, transform the variable set and variable get into the config um, I, method? I don't know what the Drupal module upgrader does with variable get and variable set, hmm. uh, but that might offer you a path. Like there's a, there's a piece of code called the Drupal module upgrader, which doesn't, it's not part of core, but it's, um, it's uh, in contrib that, okay. that takes a Drupal 7 module and tries to update the code to, to Drupal 8. It right. probably makes recommendations. It probably, if it sees variable set, it probably says, "Think about how you store this in configuration." Okay, so if I don't use that module, then I have to search for every variable set and get, and then yep. replace that. Yeah. So it's like uh, more or less like building new set rather than upgrading the Drupal seven. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for the previous question about site-specific overrides and the example of having, uh, say, a, a Twitter API key. And, and the concern about, about having to hard code that in the settings.php file, there's two things that I would mention. Um, one is that settings.php doesn't actually have to be a monolithic single file. You can have specific settings.environment.php and your settings.php can also load other specific files. So you can have one standard settings.php that loads from whatever somehow in PHP, because it's PHP, whatever else you want. And another thing about the, the uh, something like a Twitter API key is there's actually a security case for not storing that in a Git repository that's off with all of the other configuration permissions, because that's a specific piece of private data that's specific to that site. Um, so so it's, it's, I don't think it's actually quite as, as onerous as having to manually edit a settings.php file for all of your 200 multi-site sites. You can, you can automate that in a different way, still using it so your, your main settings.php site for this specific multi-site in instance goes off and loads a separate file that contains that information if necessary, and that doesn't have to be done manually. So Thanks, Dr. Jam. Any more questions? We're actually at time, so. Thank you very much for coming.